Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's May 17th. It's time for some more Deep Space updates. It's been a couple of weeks, but uh, we haven't had that many launches this time around. So, starting out on May 4th. May the 4th be with you brought a Starlink launch from uh, Florida. It was Group 5-6, it was 56 satellites going into a 43 degree orbit from Slick 40. Nothing special on that front, but May 8th we had Rocket Lab with the Tropics mission. Now this is the, the Tropics was originally going to be launched on Astra. It's a pair of, well, it's set as a constellation of uh, like small 3U cube satellites. And Astra was well kitted out to, to put these things into separate orbits, but of course they failed. So now Rocket Lab gets to do this and their mission title is Rocket Like a Hurricane. Good job. So yeah, launched out of a uh, New Zealand, this was uh, two of the four remaining Tropic satellites. Uh, I was kind of worried for a while that uh, after it got into orbit, they didn't announce communications with the spacecraft, but it sounds like they're fine on that front, so good job. On May 10th, there was a Long March 7 carrying Tianzhou uh, 6, which is the your cargo spacecraft, to their space station. So that's already got up there docked. Apparently it's the the largest payload yet, I think, in terms of actual uh, mass fraction inside the spacecraft. They've made some modifications. Also in May 10th, there was a Falcon 9 from Vandenberg carrying a set of Starlink satellites, 51 Starlink satellites, to a 70 degree orbit. On May the 14th, we had a Falcon 9 carrying uh, another group of 56 Starlink satellites to a 43 degree orbit. And that's it. You're nothing really you're big to talk about other than tropics uh coming up in the next few days we do have axiom 2 so that will be the second privately funded launch to the international space station carrying four astronauts including peggy whitson so good uh you know hope hopefully that goes off just fine uh speaking of dragon uh, prior to the last one there was a the, the trunk from one of the previous Dragon missions actually deorbited over the US and a bunch of people actually got footage of this piece of spacecraft breaking up and I'm sure we'll actually find some bits of debris if the Australian find is anything to go from. But actually, more interestingly in terms of things falling off of Falcons, if you remember in the previous one we had, the previous episode we had this big uh, Falcon Heavy launch, right? The one where they sacrificed all the boosters to the god of Delta V. And they were not going to recover the boosters, but they did decide to recover those fairings. And those fairings drop off after second stage separation. So these were the fastest pieces of hardware that SpaceX has recovered from suborbital flight, because obviously they've recovered Dragon capsules. Uh, these don't have a heat shield, right? I mean, they do have some thermal protection because they have to go through the initial launch and max Q. Anyway, they have footage from this. They have footage from the onboard cameras and it is exquisite. Oh, this is so beautiful watching this plasma build up, rage and get really power and then it fades away very, very quickly. And I think... I think this might be real time. I haven't got confirmation. I'm presuming that it's real time and it goes from literally you know, tens of thousands of kilometers per hour down to near subsonic speeds in about 30 seconds or so. And if you think about it, the fairings are sort of going side on flat, a bit like Starship will go. And there's not much in the way of mass. So they have a very low ballistic coefficient. It's just going to slow way down very, very quickly. So anyway, after that, they were apparently recovered. That's how we got the footage. And they spent a long time traveling back. And we did actually see that. I was worried that they would be super toasty like marshmallows. But we caught a peek underneath the tarps. And they don't look too bad. All the same, if they don't fly these again, I would be unsurprised. This was really such an extreme event. They didn't know what they were going to get. Uh, you know, if they do decide to retire them, put them in a museum. Those are special. Um, anyway, in Scotland, construction has begun on the actual launch site in the north of Scotland in Forest. Uh, but at this point now, questions are... There are questions about who's going to use it because Orbex is the one that's currently funding this. They just had their CEO, uh, Chris Larmer, step down. There isn't a schedule for completion of the site. They've just announced that they've started building it. And there's no schedule for a first launch by the Orbex Prime rocket at this point. 
There were other people that had been in line to use this site, notably ABL Space Systems, who are working with Lockheed to provide launch services in the UK. Uh, but they've since moved their launch to the Saxe-Vord spaceport uh, further north in the Shetland Islands. So that's not part of mainland Scotland. Uh, Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Interesting announcement is VAST. Yes, the VAST space station, smaller and less ambitious than other commercial stations that that are like supported by NASA. So yeah, there's been a proliferation of potential uh, privately funded space stations, and NASA is working with Axiom and Orbital Reef and uh, Voyager space systems to build a few with government help. But VAST just sort of came out of nowhere and said, ha, we're going to put a small space station in orbit by 2025. And caveats, this is really, this is a very minimal uh, piece of hardware by the looks of things. They have big plans, but they have a minimal vi viable product for this, which looks like a pressure vessel with some attitude control power docking hardware. Um, and it's not clear what kind of life support is on board because they explicitly said that they would expect the visiting Dragon spacecraft to uh, assist with the life support. So what this is, is it's like a camper trailer in space for your, your Dragon. They can go up, get inside, the people have a little more room to hang out, move it. It's really aimed at uh, private astronauts, also known as space tourists. Now you might be wondering, if NASA isn't funding this station, who's putting up the money? Well, it's a you know, private individual, a guy called Jed McCaleb, who you maybe have heard of, maybe you haven't. You might have heard of things that he's done. He created like a peer-to-peer uh, -peer sharing client, but most importantly, uh, he created a website where you could trade your Magic the Gathering cards, magicthegatheringonlineexchange.com, right? Uh, except that that didn't take off. So instead, he created a Bitcoin trading site called Mount Gox, which he then sold and, you know, went on and did other things. But there, that's where he comes from. And he's put a bunch of his money into basically letting people have a space camper in space. And I'm all for that. It, it, is, po it is entirely possible that this thing actually moves and executes faster because it's so much more simple in scope than the other ones, which are going to have to satisfy all the requirements for NASA. Um, okay, China space plane. It had been in orbit for months and months and we didn't know what it was doing out there. It finally returned home and landed. Again, they are still not making any public statements about what it was doing on orbit. However, LEO Labs published uh, some uh, a document basically pointing out they had been following it and they saw that it had released a sub-satellite and then it had maneuvered with the satellite, it had returned to the satellite, it had basically performed proximity operations with a sub-satellite. What's that for? I don't know. Hey, if you were building a space plane to say, you know, pluck a satellite out of space, that might work. Of course, the US has already considered that. Uh, LEO Labs also in the last 24 hours highlighted a case where there was a close approach between a Chinese satellite cryptically named Object D because it's like a piece of another launch and a Cosmos 1536 which is a 1984 Soviet satellite. These things are in polar orbits and yesterday they swung by each other at you know 15 kilometers per second relative velocity with a separation of 30 meters. That's 100 feet. That was a close shave. We very quickly, we we very narrowly missed uh, getting some uh, Kessler going on. Um, in deep space, the European Space Agency has excitedly announced that the juice is loose. Yes, the RIM antenna, the radar imaging for um, icy moons experiment, the 16 meter long antenna had not deployed initially when it was commanded and they had been trying to figure out how to get it out. So they had, well, they, they brought the engine online because they needed it for maneuvering and they tried to use the maneuvering in collaboration, in, in conjunction with rotations, with heat soaks, cold soaks, and uh, re-triggering the actuating pin. One of the pins had become lodged and they hoped by thermal expansion and contraction to make this actually pop out so the antenna did. And they had an engineering camera, so they caught that moment when this massive antenna pops out. We have this nice little graph showing vibrations on the spacecraft. You know, yeah, space engineering, it works. Uh, 
or maybe it was Space Viagra, I don't know, but it certainly is loose and it is excited. It is letting it all hang out in deep space now, and I hope to see the results from that penetrating survey instrument. Vulcan has been out on the pad during doing more testing, close to a wet dress rehearsal as we understand it. They were loading fuel on board. It had the first and the second stage integrated on the pad. And uh, apparently as a result of this, there's a few settings that are going to have to change in their software. Things like your know, positions of valves and hydraulic uh, actuators. They're going to have to take it back and make some tweaks to the engines before they roll it back out for a proper test fire on the stand. And then after that, they're going to be getting pretty close to actually launching the vehicle. The one big question that remains about Vulcan is what will be the results of their investigation for the energetic event that happened at Marshall Space Flight Center where a Centaur upper stage tank which was undergoing stress testing sprung a leak and then that hydrogen you know basically found an ignition source and generated a large fireball. I was actually there and it was hard to see that there had been any damage to be honest but then again it was very hard to see where it was. Luna HMAP uh, has been officially abandoned. If you remember, this launched on Artemis and it was supposed to go into you know, lunar orbit to do some investigations. Unfortunately, the fuel system has, oh sorry, the engine has never worked because the fuel system has been unable to open its valves. So they use this uh, iodine ion thruster from Busek. And yeah, the, basically their statement is that the uh, the system was never designed to sit in storage for as long as it did. This was basically, they had loaded it onto the vehicle and then the vehicle had to go in and out, in and out, shake it all about. It didn't, it sat around. And iodine, if you know, it can leak into gaps and then it can solidify. So yeah, that's that's probably what happened. The, the valve is stuck because it has frozen iodine inside it. And so they've given up and the v the spacecraft isn't going to be able to perform its mission. There has been a pretty lousy hit rate for the satellites on board Artemis, largely because they were integrated with the vehicle and had to sit there for a very long time. Some of them came out and their batteries weren't operational. Anyway, um, on the other hand, Momentus with their Vigoride spacecraft, they announced that they have successfully demonstrated a microwave electrothermal thruster using water as a propellant. So this is, uh, this is it's a rocket engine that uses water and it uses a lot of electricity. It heats up the water to steam, but actually super hot steam inside a microwave cavity and that shoots out. They get pretty good specific impulses out of this thing and it doesn't you know, so to get better thrust than using an ion engine, lower specific impulses for about the same power. It's, it's a nice little technology. And of course, water is nice because it's cheap and, well, very non-toxic given that I am 80% water. And finally, Kathy Luders, who left NASA earlier this month, or at the start of this month, is basically saying she's going to be working at SpaceX. She is going to be working at Starbase in Texas on how to integrate, how to how to make the uh, human landing system and other stuff human rated. That's that's going to be her stuff. She is going to be reporting directly to Gwyn Shotwell. And I mean, this is an interesting turnaround, of course, because she was there when HLS was signed. So yeah, good luck, Kathy. Uh, we're all hoping that uh, we will actually get Artemis on the moon uh, by the, before the end of the decade. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.